since most of you folks um, did not express interest really in seeing in seeing the video about the final exam, what I'm going to do is just um, I'm going to depend on the fact that you are those who are interested are going to be looking at or have looked at the uh, PDF versions of these. Of course, this video will probably be posted before I manage to post those, but. Um, but what's my point? Oh, so what I'm going to do is just kind of walk you through my solutions, but I'm not really going to walk you through them. I'm going to expect that you can follow them here on the paper. I'm just going to add in a couple explanatory notes to show you what I was doing. Okay, um, so very quickly through the computational problems. First one, we have the disk of charge and oop, disk of charge, and we have the wire here. Um, those are my geometries and labels right there. For the wire, we can just use Gauss's law, so it's pretty darn straightforward. So there it is. Um, you've seen that before for a wire. Um, for the disk, however, we can't. We must integrate. So what we're going to do, the important thing is we're going to integrate this dqr over, oops, 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 that's supposed to be an r hat excuse me, here, this should be an R hat. This one is the R in R cubed. So I'll fix that before I post it. Um, so the electric field is just a DQ, and then the R in the R cubed are the difficult things, or the R vector in the R. So we just need to um, define the distance from the point on the disk to Y2, and if we take, define with this coordinate system right here, then rho is our radius variable in the xz plane, and then our x and z coordinates are just um, rho cosine theta and rho sine theta, and the vector that will get us out to y, this point p, where y equals y2, is just this vector right here. The r cubed is just the rho squared plus y2 squared to the three halves. And then it's just a matter of plugging into the equations. And so that's what we do. So um, when we do that, one interesting thing to check, we'd like to know that um, when we go to, when the radius of that disk is equal to infinity, we want to get the solution for a, uh, an infinite plane. It's got to be the solution for the infinite plane. So I just did a quick check on that down here. And that's what's at the lower corner there. So that's good. All right. Um, da -da -da. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. And so those are the values. So th I, I did the two values separately, the one for the wire, the one for the disk, and then what's the total? You just add them together. And then the question is, can we find a spot where these, where they will cancel one another out? Basically, can we find a spot where we could put a charge and that charge would feel no net force? And the answer is that we can. Um, and how do we know that we can? We know we can because these are both in the J hat direction. They're both along the Y axis. And so, we know we can find some place where they will, um, the, the value for each of those will exactly cancel each other out. One will be going this direction, the other going in that direction, we're done. Okay. Um, okay, number two, the exact same geometry, except now we have a spinning disk and we have a wire that is moving with a velocity v. So the only tricky part, well, there's a couple tricky parts. Tricky part is figuring out what our currents are, because we're now interested in the uh, magnetic fields, which are by mo created by moving charges, which we usually express in terms of our currents. And so since we're most familiar with that, we don't have to do it this way, but since we're most familiar with that, we're going to think of it in terms of currents. And so once again, we have symmetry where we can use Ampere's law, oops, Ampere's law for the, um, the wire. And when we do that, like I said, the only trick is what is the current? Well, what is current? It's just dq dt. So, oops, excuse me, where am I? I can't see a thing. Where am I? Way over here. Yeah, okay. It's just dq dt. Well, that's the same as dq dz and dz dt. 
What's dz dt? That's our velocity. What's dq dz? That's our charge um, density, or yeah, our charge density lambda. And so, um, so lambda v is the exact same thing as i. So we are all set by just putting lambda v in for i in the expression that we get from Ampere's law, which is mu zero i over two pi r. Um, You'll notice I put a negative sign in here, and the reason I put that negative sign in here is just to get the directional sign right when we define our radius in this way. So the, these radii are the exact same as in the previous problem, which means that from here, from the wire, this way is d minus y2, and um, I'm sorry, that's exactly backwards. It's y2 minus d, so it's a negative number. But when y2, if y2 were out here, it would be a positive number. So um, why is this important? Because the direction of this we get by the right-hand rule, and if we set this up properly, then we are, our equation will always give us the right direction. So now the, tr the only other trick is that for the Biot-Savart law, which we must use for the the rotating disk there, from we must use for this portion of it here, um, for the Biot-Savart law, we have to figure out what dl is. And remember, what, so what we're doing is we are pretending or we are treating this as if it's a bunch of loops of current. Well, how much is in that current? The i is just, well, it's sigma 2 pi rho d rho. So that's the, um, that's the current that is in one little ring that's a d rho, a thickness of d rho. I'm sorry, that's the charge that is in that little rho. So what's the current? Well, the current is just you take that and you, you multiply it by the velocity divided by the distance accomplished or the distance traveled in a certain time interval, and that's what the angular velocity is. So we just have a rho omega over 2 pi rho, which ends up just being um, omega over 2 pi. And so what does that end up with? Our current is then just sigma omega r dr. Or excuse me, this should not be an r here. This should be a rho, a rho d rho. So I'll try to fix that too. I hope I remember this stuff. Okay. Um, then the only other tricky thing is what's the dl in our Biot-Savart law? Well, the dl is in the direction that goes around this, this loop here. So wait, what is that right here on the x-axis? It's actually in the z direction when theta is defined like this. That's the theta hat direction, direction. But it's in the z direction right here, which means that our dl starts out as it is um, cosine theta z, k hat or z hat and sine, uh, minus sine theta um, x hat or i hat, okay? So that's where this dl comes from there. And then we already have the r from the previous part of the problem, so we just have to do dl cross r, and then it's pretty straightforward. We just um, do our algebra and a little, bit of, a little bit of calculus as well to do the Biot-Savart law. Now, once we do this, Oh, excuse me, when we do this, we find out that, from my coordinate system here, this disk is creating a magnetic field in the j-hat direction, or, oops, y-hat. Gosh, I should do this now, so this is y. I should do all these corrections while I'm thinking of it. What did I forget here? Yes, okay. All right, um, so it's in the j-hat direction, and the one from the wire is in the x hat or i hat direction, which you can just figure out by the right hand rule. So can we ever get to a spot where those two can cancel out? No, they're, they're orthogonal to one another, so they cannot cancel one another out. All right, um, next one. Next one is, oh, we have satellites in orbit, and I just drew one little segment of it right here. So there's our, our E satellite and our B satellite. This one's actually pretty straightforward. If you think of the electric field satellites as separate from the magnetic field satellites. So what happens in one orbit 
In one orbit, there are eight satellites. Those satellites have a certain electric field within them. Those electric field, the electric field, means that there is a potential difference from one end to the other. Once we know the potential difference, the change in energy is just Q times V. Once we know QV is the change in energy for each satellite it goes through, we know that QV must equal one half MV squared. We're adding kinetic energy by getting rid of potential energy. So. We, we know that our, for each pass through one of those satellites, for each pass through a satellite, we add an energy Q delta V, and we know that that we, is defined in terms of the electric field and the distance, just by, this is just the definition of potential. We know that the length of one of those, is we're given that, so the total energy added going through N satellites is just N times that. And since we start at V equals zero, then we know that the, we're, we're increasing the velocity incrementally each time we go through one of those. And so if we go through N, then we increase the velocity N times. And so this is just the expression we end up with for V sub N. Well, meanwhile, what are we doing with the magnetic field? For the magnetic field, what we're doing is we are, there are eight of these satellites those eight satellites must manage to turn this beam 360 degrees. That means one of those satellites must turn it 360 divided by eight, which is 40, 45, I hope. Um, or in radians, it's much easier. It's just two pi divided by eight, so it's pi over four. So, um, so, uh, so then what do we know? We know that in... Uh, let's see if I can get this. Okay, we know that in this distance, which is 100 meters, excuse me, er, nope, er, er, I can almost do it backwards. Okay, in that distance, which is 100 meters, we know that these, the, um, the beam must turn by pi over 4 radians, and therefore we know that the radius is just r times that angle. So, Whatever the radius is, we can just solve for the radius knowing the angle and knowing the length. So r theta equals L, which is what we have here. But we also know that because it's a magnetic field, we know that these, this r goes a constant uniform magnetic field. We know the r follows this equation, which means we can, can, we can calculate b. So now we have b, and now we have v, and the v changes for each time that we go through. Therefore, the b is going to change just based upon that. So the B follows that same expression, um, and then it's just a matter of putting the numbers in, and there we go. Okay, so next one. For the particle accelerator of the previous problem, now what we're doing is we're looking at what if there was a wire that was looped just inside the orbit of those satellites, and we could recover some of the energy that was put into those satellites, or put into those um, electric and magnetic fields, by using that loop, there's going to be a magnetic flux change as we go from these particles traveling zero to these particles moving, whizzing around the Earth. And as the magnetic flux changes, it is going to create a voltage. That's what the law of induction is. So, um, so we are, so what we're going to do then is we're going to calculate the magnetic flux so that we can, can then calculate the change in the magnetic flux. And if we can calculate change in magnetic flux, that automatically gives us the EMF. And so, um, which is what E dot D of Faraday's law, E dot DL equals minus D DT of the magnetic flux. All right, so we, how do we set that problem up? Well, we need to figure out what the current is. So the current, first of all, um, we have a bundle of charges, big Q, and that's just N times the proton, the charge on a single proton. So we have that bundle of charges, big Q, and that bundle of charges goes around at this rate. V over 2 pi R is the rate in seconds by which it goes around. So if it goes around the Earth 58 times in a second, then the current is will be given by that ratio. Okay, so um, so that's the current. That's what uh, that's how I came up with this expression right here. Okay, 
So now we're going to make a couple assumptions. You will remember from an earlier video in the course that when you have a current loop, the value of the magnetic field does change within that current loop. However, it's pretty flat within it. If this was the current loop, we, it, we, it starts out pretty low, but goes to some value, kind of stays constant and comes back over here. So we're just going to assume that that's a uniform magnetic field. So if we calculate it for the center of the loop, we'll be done. So um, we could just remember that, that it's mu zero i over 2r. Um, we could just remember that, or it's pretty straightforward to use the Biot-Savart law for that, because it's just, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty straightforward integral right here, because this, um, the angle between d theta and r does not change. So we can just do this d theta integral, and what do we get? We get mu zero i over 2r. Okay, so what's the total flux? The total flux is just the magnetic field times the area, which is pi r squared. And so we end up with the magnetic flux. The total flux is just magnetic field times pi r squared. And we end up with this number over here, which ends up being about one tesla meter squared. Well, how long does it take to get to that field? Oh, I'm sorry. The reason I want to know how long it takes to get to that level is because I'm going to assume that this is uniformly accelerating. It's too complicated to try to figure out it's every one-eighth of a rotation, the rate of the current would change. So let's just assume it's a uniform acceleration all the way throughout. And if we do that, we'll just take the average velocity, divide it by the total distance, and we know then the time it takes to go from zero to the, the speed it's going at the end of its one million orbits around the Earth. And so that's just a very simple, straightforward calculation. That's just... You take the distance divided by the average velocity, and you get that it takes about 40 seconds for this to happen. And then this, the final part of our, of our work here is just we are going to assume, we are assuming, that this is a uniform change in magnetic flux. Therefore, we don't need to wor really worry about the differentials. We'll just take the delta um, phi sub b delta in the change in the magnetic flux, divided by the overall change in time. So we're assuming it's linear, and we, we'll get a, a, a rate. Well, excuse me, when we get that, that is our EMF. And so you can see how simple that equation is when we're there. We know our magnetic field goes from zero to one tesla meter squared, and our, it takes 40 seconds to do that, and we end up getting a whole whopping 25 millivolts out of that loop of current. Probably not worth it. Okay, finally, the last question. Um, this is the one that I thought was going to be really easy. I hope that um, it will appear to you that way now, even if it did when you weren't doing the test. So we have a capacitor that is hooked up to a, excuse me, we have a battery a capacitor a resistor and a switch in a circuit. And we are looking for the time it takes to charge. We're given that the fact it take, it reaches 63% of its value at a certain time. So what is that time? Well, that time is just, this is the expression for the current, um, the charge as a function of time. And so we end up when we have, are at 63%, that means 1 minus e to the minus t over rc is equal to 63%, which means that 37 or 0.37 equals e to the minus t over rc. Well, 0.37 is just 1 over e. So what that means is minus t over rc is minus 1, or t over rc equals 1. So to begin with, we know that t over rc equals 1 at 100 seconds. So that's our t1. So that's our t1. Okay, so then what do we do? Now we're going to add a resistor in parallel and a capacitor in parallel. When we add resistor in parallel, how does it add? It adds a bit like this, so it goes to r over 2. When we add the capacitor in parallel, it adds like this, so we get 2c. Now what's the equation for the discharge in a capacitor? Well, that's just q0 e to the minus t over rc. And we're asked when does it reach 0.37 or 37 percent of its value. Well when does it do that? When it equals 1 over e. So if it equals 1 over e that means that t2 over rc equals 1. But what is our new rc? 
in the new circuit. Our new RC is just our old R, excuse me, our R new times our C new, but that's just R over 2 times 2C, which is the same RC. What is RC equal? RC up here was to equal to T1. What's T1? T1 is equal to 100 seconds. So there is no change in the time it takes to, there is no difference between the time it takes to charge up to 63% of its value and discharge to 37% of its value. And, um, and that's that. Okay, um, that's it. Those are the computational problems. And I will post these soon.